everyone. I'm WABC Chief Meteorologist Lee Goldberg. This is whether or not, and kind of an emergency episode of whether or not, in a good way, don't be nervous. But we have this really cool phenomenon if you like getting to your destination early when you're flying. Uh, something really cool happened with a recent transatlantic flight going from JFK to Heathrow. And they arrived an hour early because they were traveling nearly 800 miles an hour at about 30,000 feet or so. And the reason for that was the jet stream, which is kind of amplified right now, um, a jet streak they ran into. And what happens is, is that over the country right now, our jet stream actually isn't that strong over the nation or unusually strong, about 60 to 80 mile per hour winds over the tri-state, more like 80 to 100 mile per hour winds. But over the Atlantic and right in that core flight plan or traffic lane heading to the UK, there's a jet streak and it's going almost 200 miles an hour. So if you think about that, and that's at the back of these planes going eastward over the Atlantic, it just gives you this giant push and you get to arrive early. Um, doesn't happen all the time. We do want to stress that this isn't necessarily a climate change issue. In a warmer globe, sometimes you're not going to see as much temperature contrast. You may not actually have as strong a jet stream, so we're not going to necessarily connect it to that. But we will say that this time of year, when you're still at the push-pull, if you still have some tropical air masses, remember the tropical season doesn't end until late November. There's still a lot of latent heat release in the south. And then you now you have some of your Arctic air coming southward. You have a lot of temperature contrast, and that can also drive some of the very strong winds. So with that said... Let's talk to an expert about flying in winds like this. We're going to talk to Captain Dennis Tager. He's a pilot with American Airlines, also a spokesperson for the Allied Pilots Association and for the Pilot Union for American Airlines, and he flew yesterday. Captain, so nice to have you on Whether or Not. Oh, it's my pleasure, and uh, you started this off with all the details that I look at during uh, flight planning uh, right on up to late last night when I arrived. So is it something unusual to you? I mean, have you, would you say that a 200 knot jet stream, a 200 mile per hour jet stream is something that is very rare? Uh, yeah, it's, it's rare enough. I mean, we have it on seasonality. You talked about it and uh, you, you rightfully recognize it over the uh, CONUS, the U.S. Uh, mainland that um, it's not as common to have it uh, that strong. It's currently over the transatlantic area. Um, but we do get that primarily during the winter months. Um, and uh, it's it can be a, a real gift when you're looking at the clock and getting someplace. Right. If you're pointed in the right direction, you know, Mother Nature can be a real assistant uh, in getting you there quicker. But if you're coming back uh, west, um, that maybe adds an hour to your flight. And um, aside from just the, the effect on the airplane, which we'll talk about, uh, when you're thinking about, oh, I've got to get a connecting flight when I land uh, right. in New York onward to a mid-continent destination. So um, <laughs> it, it can be the best of times and the worst of times. So so let's talk about that pre-flight plan, given that type of wind profile and how you would navigate with it going eastward or coming back into it. I mean, how much can you rarely, you know, if you talk about the the sort of width of the, these jet stream winds, I mean, how far away of it could you go, um, you know, to minimize its impact coming west? And, and will you obviously design the flight plan to go, in, you know, directly in the heart of it if you're headed eastward? Uh, great questions. And, and we have to note that we have dispatchers and weather experts uh, in the, um, I'll call it the factory floor before I even see the flight plan. So my job is, is to bring it all together, look at it, ask questions, um, because there are other things that happen with high winds at, at altitude. And I know, I know you're aware of this as a weather expert. Um, the, the, think of the, the winds like water. Mm -hmm. It'll help you as we talk of this. It's not that complicated, but the more intense the wind is, if it's not bumbling over rocks, you're likely to have straight winds without a lot of bumps. But as you gain altitude, there's different um, velocities of winds and pressure. And in that boundary layer between where the high, high winds are and the lesser winds, you have a lot of air bubbling up and basically creating turbulence. For instance, the area you're talking about, I looked over the transatlantic on some great technology that we have right on the flight deck. Um, and I saw those winds, as you said, over 200 miles an hour, that is really ripping through the sky. Mm -hmm. um, but with that came warnings 
of moderate to severe turbulence at certain altitudes. So while this gift of Mother Nature, if you're pointing in the right direction, mm. is welcome, it also has some barnacles with it. Mm. So you can't just say, hey, great, we'll get there early, we're saving some gas. Uh, you have to look at what other threats are coming with this gift from Mother Nature. So um, it takes uh, two experienced, and, so, and over the transatlantic, you have three pilots, along with a team of, of weather experts and dispatchers to ensure that you're not just jumping into those favorable winds, but you're looking at uh, the side effect of that as well. And, and these winds, as you know, and have dis uh, may describe later, you know, they happen at different altitudes, mm -hmm. right? So we have to look at what's the ride like in the jet stream? Ooh, it's really rough. Um, can we descend lower and take advantage of the jet stream, but not have that rough ride? So it's, it's a three-dimensional uh, space. Mm -hmm. And sometimes talking about the rough ride, uh, maybe laterally we change, mm -hmm. you know, it's a trade-off. You're going, you're higher up, but that's where the bumps are. I don't want to use up more gas. Go when I'm lower, you use up more gas on jet engines. So um, maybe I can laterally change, stay higher, and, and it's kind of a Venn diagram. Get mm. the benefits and ensure that the safety of your passengers is at an all-time high. When you find that sweet spot, you, it's, well, that's what you flight plan to, knowing that when you get there, it may have changed. That's fascinating. Let, let, let's just continue on this turbulence tangent in just a second, obviously because, number one, uh, we've seen more episodes of severe turbulence. Um, it, you talked about that sweet spot. That was actually the phrase in my head. Is this a constant adjustment? Um, when you say laterally, vertically, is, is it constant tweaking? Like, I mean, look, give me even just like in the, in the window of an hour. Are you constantly on that rudder or steering wheel to change things? A uh, great point. So the stick and rudder on it, you know, usually if you're at cruise, um, you, you're the autopilot is on. We fly most of the airplane during critical phase on the 737, you know, hands on. Um, but the autopilot is on. It takes you, it gives you a chance to not look, stare down the straw of, you know, of the stick and rudder. So it's technology that helps safety and helps ease our workload so we can focus on the, that planning. So we're looking at it all the time. For instance, uh, yesterday coming in um, from uh, uh, Austin, we went from Austin to Charlotte. Uh, it was clear skies, but we had an alert pop up because we have some technology. It's crowdsourcing of what the ride's like. It's literally my iPad that I have all my flight planning on. And when I activate this app, if the airplane's bumping around, the iPad can sense that, sends a signal that on my aircraft, I'm experiencing light turbulence, mm. or the aircraft ahead of me has got moderate turbulence. We can see where they are and what altitude they are, and it's graphically displayed. And yesterday with clear skies, uh, po probably related to some of the jet stream, not the most severe one you're talking about, but when there's bends in the jet stream that can cause turbulence, just like water through a creek. Mm. Um, we saw an area that other airplanes were actually not just reporting, but experiencing because we saw in this crowdsourcing piece, uh, this moderate turbulence. So what do we do? I talk with my first officer and um, said, well, if we go lower a little bit earlier, we'll avoid that. And it's not something you need to be a pilot to see. When you see the graphic, mm -hmm. you would go, well, why don't you just go there? And the answer is, no reason not to. Mm. So we're always adjusting. It's not just for comfort, but it's to ensure that that uh, we're safe. Because um, if you're not strapped into the airplane, connected to it with your seatbelt, uh, you're exposed to Mother Nature's um, sort of manic behavior. Sometimes it can happen, and and it can happen quick. Mm -hmm. um, so we take it seriously. Back to that return flight plan, because I am just looking at the core of those winds. Would you just go straight headwind or do you mean, do you, do you go as far north as like a Greenland and try to get out of those core of those winds? Or is that just, you've gone too far, you're going to use more fuel, it's not worth it. You're really not going to save any time during the way back. It's a great point. You, you work, again, because there's different, um, not escape plans, but plans to util, you know take the benefit and not all the risk. So there are times, and, and going transatlantic, by the way, if you look at uh, a display, you'll see it looks like, why are they going, making a circle going way up? Right. Well, it's geography. The, any round sphere, and I used to teach kids at school, and we would do that when teaching geometry, take a string and go around the basketball, mm -hmm. and then take that same string and go over the top. You'll see that the string is longer if you just go straight mm -hmm. line than if you take the great circle route. The great circle route is actually something that, that it, 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 uh, ships used 
So, of course, we exploit that to an uh, nth degree in aviation because it happens quickly. So, so that that's unrelated to the jet stream. But when a jet stream is lined up with that, then you have the potential for bonanza in uh, coming in early or being an, an anchor on you coming in late, pointing in the wrong direction. But most importantly, that ride condition. So. Um, you're probably not going to adjust your great circle route because now it's more miles on your flight plan, but you might find a place where, well, it's more miles, but I've got this great tailwind. So I'm even up. We're going to be there on time. Um, and a lot of it, computers help with this, not only on the aircraft, but while they're planning it and models. So um, the collaboration of computer technology with human judgment it helps us do this job better and more safely. You know, computers are really good at complicated problems, mm. but human beings are really good at complex problems. Mm. And well when said. you're dealing with the jet stream, it's a complex issue. So you find that, that blend of the computer technology, the technology you have available, and then judgment. I've been doing this for over 30 years mm. and just looking at what's going on over the transatlantic, um, I could see spots where, yeah, I'm not, I'm not interested in getting that close to that area of threat because I know that threat is probably growing looking at the winds and, um, um, it comes with experience, but every pilot who's trained to fly and has a responsibility of flying, particularly transatlantic, um, has some level of that. And the great news is they have a wonderful support team of folks, uh, who have expertise like yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, and when that teams up, um, you know, Mother Nature has uh, an adversary if she's trying to harm us or a partner if she's going to be an assistant. That tech, well said. That technology, by the way, um, two-parter, are planes flying any faster? Or do they have the capability to fly any faster with modern day engines that they used to? And what's, if you had that strong steering wind at your back, what's the fastest you've seen on your speedometer in the, uh, in the airline? Uh, we do it by nine. And first off, yes, airplanes, uh, this, the Boeing 787, um, it's a function of not only the engines, but the way the wing is designed and the okay. material. They've been able to squeeze out of it. We travel in percent of the speed of sound. Oh, wow. And it sounds like, well, how does that work? Well, I'll give you something you may have heard. Uh, hey, we're, we're, that airplane's flying at Mach 2. What's mm -hmm. Mach? Mach is essentially the percent of the speed of sound. So airliners are generally flying... Uh, like 77, 78% of the speed of sound. Mm. Uh, 787 is normally flying at like 0 0.87, 0 0.86. It sounds like a small difference in a percentage of the speed of sound, but it's quite a bit and it can make a substantial difference in, in travel time. Um, so what's the most I've seen? We measure it in knots. You know, it's about 20% more and all your numbers that you talked about miles per hour mm -hmm. for, for all folks listening. That's what I identify with too. Of course. Um, you know, I've seen in the range of uh, 650, or excuse me, a 680, 650 uh, across the ground because you don't really care as a passenger and as a pilot either right. uh, what your actual true airspeed is and get kind of complex. The bottom line is I'm going from A to B to take people there. Um, I want to know how fast am I traveling across the ground? Okay. So what's going up in Mother Nature, it's again, visualize a boat in the water and um, uh, the current is up against it. It's moving relative to the surface uh, at a more struggled rate. Okay. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does. It does. Let, let's talk practical in terms of now a huge travel season coming up. And I wanted to get your recommendations on something. Okay. So the first thing I was thinking of, okay, great. We arrive early, but my experience with some of these really uh, early flights is sometimes there aren't gates available. So you might be sitting and taxing for a while. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you about was, do you have uh, a recommendation in terms of times to fly? Maybe it's during the day versus during the week um, to potentially maximize these steering winds that we're seeing now. Um, I, you know, obviously during the, I know during the heating of the day, we're going to see some of our, our, our maximum wind flow as this more differential heating, but I wanted to get your feeling on that. So maybe some tips for folks that are trying to expedite their, their rides in a time where travel can be super frustrating. Well, first I want to compliment you on, on getting to the gate available because um, <laughs> we're talking about getting there early and uh, and you're having a conversation. I had my my first officer yesterday because we were about 20 minutes early uh, to a destination. Most of us do because we got out of another airport more quickly 
and the winds helped a little bit. So, you know, what can passengers do as far as it comes to the winds? And by the way, airlines, all airlines, including American Airlines, we, we know what the historic wind pattern generally is. Someone might say, well, why don't you just schedule the flight for these massive jet streams? Well, you don't know when they're coming. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some forecasting, but something that's this intense is, um, I don't want to call it a storm, but think of it like that because it's not something you can plan on all the time. Okay. But clearly the airlines during the winter, that jet stream comes on down to, uh, to the south and um, you can get some historic data on that so that you can flight plan your schedules, uh, the tickets you sell, knowing that you're gonna have a bit more going during the winter. Mm -hmm. But see, it can be on the other side of that too. I talked earlier, you know, when you're, you're pointing in the same direction as the jet stream, hey, we're gonna get there early going the other way, mm -hmm. now you're gonna get there late. How late? And if you have a connecting flight, you know, I'm always nervous when I book flights uh, and our connection seems like, you know, a good idea. You don't wanna get ridiculous on it, but that's that's got me into the, uh, if I see something under an hour, I get a little nervous mm -hmm. as I get on the airplane for connecting flights. So um, it, it kind of goes both ways. Um, so there, I don't really have any direct tips other than the standard one is traveling at the beginning of the day. Yes. Generally, all the airplanes, when you start early in the morning, are there from the night before. So mm -hmm. they haven't been impacted by any delays. So starting earlier is always, you know, gonna increase your odds, um, but it's a fickled airspace. So if mother nature doesn't come in and mess things up for you, uh, sometimes mankind can come in with staffing issues. You know, we've right. all heard out of New York, they had to reduce the flying, continue to do that because they don't have enough air traffic controllers. So um, it is a, a, a symphony. And if any of the instruments is out of tune, or if God forbid somebody's playing a kazoo, you're going to hear it. <laughs> um, again, just a, let me, thinking back to that time of day, you were saying also for those that are more concerned about turbulence, do you like an early morning flight or a nighttime flight? You know, for turbulence, um, it's, as you know, convective weather, any weather yes. that's happening, sans the jet stream, you're likely to have disrupted air. So earlier in the day is usually better, um, but not always the case. Um, you know, we're coming into the winter season. Uh, matter of fact, I had my first de-icing of the season mm. on this trip uh, out of Chicago. We had, you know, an inch of snow come through. Mm -hmm. So um, that's another thing Mother Nature can deliver. And, and airlines don't schedule like, well, you might get the ice, so I'm gonna add a half hour to your scheduled time when you mm -hmm. buy the ticket. Um, they can't operate like that. As you mentioned, gate space is tight just about everywhere, and it's not a function of the pandemic. It's just great news, P airplanes are flying, and there's limited geography to you know get them on a gate. So um, uh, the, the way you schedule an airline has to be on what you know normally happens, but when a de-icing event happens, that's gonna probably knock you down 20 to 30 minutes uh, extra time to get to the de-icing bay and get it done. So a lot of words to bottom line say is that the summer has some issues with it that you can see in those storms um, and the rain and whether we can take off or not mm -hmm. holding and avoiding that weather. The winter's a little bit different because the, the winter hits you, you can carry it with you in a sense of snow on the airplane, gotta get it cleared off. Uh, but you're generally not diverting because of a, uh, a snowstorm that's happening in the air. It's the effect it's having on the ground, of course, the snow on the runway. So, um, boy, you're opening up my winter brain, uh, captain brain right now, <laughs> um, transitioning from the summer. And, right. and as it usually happens, mine happened with uh, from being in the 70s in Chicago, flying in clear skies to my next trip. I'm dealing with an inch of snow and, and blowing wind. Sure. So, um uh, it, it takes a trained, experienced crew, and it goes beyond just the flight deck of at least two pilots. It takes dispatchers, weather experts, those crews that go out there in de ice. Can you imagine being that person while everyone's huddled inside sure. in a de icing truck um, in a cab, trying to ensure that you de ice the aircraft, apply the uh, the special anti kind of icing gel on there, yeah. um, knowing and they're trained. These professionals are trained to know that if they don't do it right it could impact the safety of the airplane and 170 lives. So while they're squirting yeah. that stuff on your airplane and you're looking out the window, yeah. chances are they're glancing in and seeing you and you can, you can rest assured they know the impact of what they're doing and how important it is.
Wow, just gave me chills. Uh, Captain Dennis Chager with American Airlines, pilot with American Airlines. Uh, but we may have been talking about a flight that arrived early, but this was a uh, a delayed arrival to the end of whether or not, because I could have talked forever uh, about this with you. When you, when you merge uh, meteorology and aviation, it's it's fascinating to me, and, and I hope with our viewers as well. Was, uh, thank you so much for uh, incredible explanations, and, and I learned a lot. So th thank you for being with us on whether or not. Anytime, Lee. I appreciate it. No problem. That is this edition of Whether or Not. We are we are happy to be your travel agents. This is not the last time that we will uh, talk to Captain Dennis Tager. He's uh, fantastic. Um, but we'll be talking about the weather patterns. Of course, you can always uh, watch our AccuWeather forecast, and we'll give you an idea about the upper-level wind patterns if you're planning some short-term travel. We always give travel forecasts as we head on the uh, each side of the weekend, so we'll have that for you always in your seven-day AccuWeather forecast. In the meantime, safe travels for you. This has been Weather or Not, and we'll see you next time, rain or shine.